Good evening, I'm Jim Zirin. You're watching The Digital Age. Wynton Marsalis is with us tonight. Wynton Marsalis is the premier jazz trumpeter of our time. He is the artistic director and guiding spirit of jazz in Lincoln Center, and he is a man with a mission. His mission is to expand educational opportunities for children so that they will learn more about our cultural heritage. He is using, for this purpose, the social media and the internet, and he's here to tell us about it. Winton, you're welcome. All right. Hey, it's a great pleasure to be here. Now, uh, you're celebrating the 25th anniversary of Lincoln Center Jazz, and uh, right. uh, congratulations. And uh, what's happened over the last 25 years? Phew, man. So, so many, so many things. Um, it's, it's such a great story of Jazz at Lincoln Center. Not of the, the greatest story of the, of the institution, not of the music. It's of how citizens from all over New York came together to give the art, the art form its, its place in our culture and our education and the type of trials and tribulations that we went through to build the first concert halls for jazz, to establish jazz as the 12th constituent of, of Lincoln Center. And now we're in the third phase of our development where we're concentrating on how we will project our mission around the world. Now, uh, maybe you should define for us what jazz is. I mean, why is it different from <laughs> blues or bebop or <laughs> rock and roll? Yeah, well, <laughs> or classical music? You know, jazz is like the father art form of all of the, all of the arts that use drums and bass. They, they are descendants of jazz. Jazz has three basic components, improvisation, which you have the right to express things in your way, and indeed it's encouraged. Second is swing, which is the opposite of that freedom, which means you have the responsibility of doing that in negotiation with other people who are doing the same thing you're doing. So it's kind of swing is like the common sense part of jazz. And uh, then the blues. So the blues is one of the roots of jazz. And the blues, not just as music, the blues sensibility teaches you to face adversity with persistent optimism. And uh, it's something that's needed in life in general. Now, uh, W.C. Handy was the father of the blues, wasn't he? Right, and, and also a trumpet player. And also a trumpet player. <laughs> right. Now, uh, he kind of had trouble with his father, didn't he? About, uh, right. Didn't want him to be a, a, a blues right. musician. His age-old generational conflict that we have. His father was a, was a preacher into a certain type of religiousness. And uh, the blues was the opposite of that, of course, being a secular music. And the funny thing about the blues is the blues is the f foundation of secular music like the, the the great Bessie Smith famous singer of body songs and the most kind of metaphorically sexual blues pieces like organ grind and all these great things she was the, the main influence of the great Mahalia Jackson who's the most religious of gospel singers who Duke Ellington had to beg for 20 years to sing with his band and she didn't want to do it because he was was playing jazz so these things are all related like like Handy and his father they had conflict, but they were related. They were, they were different sides of the same coin. Well, uh, why is there this tension between art and religion? I mean, it seems to uh, cut across all for art forms, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, because the uh, art... Nudity and religious art, uh, it's, right. it's the same issue, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think a lot of times with religion, is a control issue. And with, with the art forms, it's an issue of freedom because art, it is, it's several functions of art. One is just art as personal expression. It's just like the classic, the Pope versus Michelangelo. Like, this is what I'm seeing. We'll put some, put some robes on those people. <laughs> well, they weren't born with robes on. Mm -hmm. So, but art is also reenactment. And, that, and in that way, art is a lot like religion because art is about the repetition of a thing over and over again. The Iliad is just retelling of a tale another way. And uh, it's, it's like I always like to say about bloodlines in America, like we're, we're, we're interdependent and we're interrelated. Many times we don't know it. So the religion will feel in some instances that it is, it has to control the art, but the art is not controllable because it's something that you come up with, you think of it as something that's apparent to you and people with that certain type of creative spark and brilliance, when they can funnel that, that, that insight into an art form, they can't even control it. Now, uh there is a form of jazz known as New Orleans jazz, oh, yeah. or is, uh, which is, is different. Uh, right. You came from New Orleans. You yes. were born in New Orleans. You grew up there. Uh, what is the difference? Well, New Orleans jazz um, has a lot of tributaries. And ragtime music, which was the first kind of popular American dance music, parlor music, with, with written music. 
music that was played on the levees by Steve Adores. French, the French Opera House was there, so it kind of light opera pieces and, and operators holding this church music and music that was, was uh, played in the streets, marching band kind of music, John Philip Sousa's music, music that was body songs played in whole houses and, and other places of ill repute. All of these things came together. And there's some other ones I'm leaving out. And in the person of a, of a man named Buddy Bolden, who was able to translate all of the aspirations of these different people into his sound. He created a way of improvising on melodies that became jazz. Now the thing about New Orleans jazz that separates it from other types of jazz is the beat, which our basic beat is. I can't, this is not a good sound for me. It's like boom, 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 boom. So that's our basic rhythm. And then we have a, a thing that we call New Orleans polyphony, where the three horns play together. The trumpet improvises, the clarinet improvises, and the trombone improvises. And uh, it creates that kind of sound of, of cacophony, but also sounds good. And that's the, the a thing that we invented that is a signature of our music. I think you said that uh, jazz is blues with precision. Right. So that's <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, right, it's the blues, you can dance with precision and a certain type of sophistication. Because if you can't play blues, you, it's very difficult to be a good jazz musician. Yeah. Now, Winton, uh, you came from a family of musicians. I mean, your father, like right. you, was a musician and a teacher because right, you're right. teaching as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, then your brothers, uh, you had five right. brothers? Five brothers. And right. what, all musicians? Um, four, four of my brothers are, three of my brothers are musicians. Yeah, my older brother plays saxophone, Branford is his name. My younger brother, Delphio, plays trombone. And my youngest brother, Jason, plays drums. My, my, my third, third brother, immediately under me, his name is Ellis, he is not a musician. And I have another brother named Mboya who is autistic, and he's also not, not a musician. Do the brothers play together from time to time? Some, sometimes, we generally only play together when my, if our father says, yeah, let's go out on a tour or something. We play, but we live in different cities. Delphio lives in New Orleans, Branford lives in, uh, outside of Durham, North Carolina, and uh, Jason also lives in New Orleans, so. And what about your mom? What sort of influence was she? Was she a musician? She was a singer. A singer. Right. And she's left-handed. So you know, I'm left-handed, too. So yep, I, she, I am, too. <laughs> and, <laughs> you, and, and Obama and Clinton are left-handed. Oh, you know, we have the left-handed crew going on. <laughs> <That's a laughs> so she, she, she mainly uh, has a deeply artistic sensibility. And my mother also is very intelligent. So she, would, she was responsible for us being, having a discipline required to, to play music. And she also supported the music and the arts. So how, what led you to uh, start with the trumpet? My father was playing with Al Hurt, who was a great trumpeter in, in New Orleans. And I was six at the time, and he was talking to Al, and he said, yeah, my son is coming up on his sixth birthday, or it might have been for Christmas, some one of those kind of, uh, some holiday in that time, and Al said, hey, I can get him a horn. And he got a trumpet for me. So that's just what I had. How old were you then? Six. Six years old. Right. And then you continued to play in school or with marching bands? You know, yeah, I played. I didn't like playing because I didn't want to get a ring around my right. lips. Yeah. Because I, trumpet players in New Orleans really had ugly looking lips. I said, if I get this lip, the girls are not going to ever like me. So I didn't practice that much until I became 12. But I did play in, in school bands. I also played in a Danny Barker's Fairview Baptist Church mar marching band when I was eight. And uh, we played New Orleans music, things like Little Liza Jane and Didn't He Ramble in New Orleans second line. So I had a, a chance to get a kind of grounding in the fundamentals of New Orleans music. I think your father was uh, the teacher, uh, or one of the teachers of Harry Connick Jr. Right, right. Now, uh, right. did you have, of course your father had to have been a mentor, but, and your mother too, but did you have any other mentors in, in, in music? Yeah, many. You know, a lot of my father's friends, they were living very extreme lives. Like they would play gigs, there's never a lot of people at their jobs, but they believed in the music. People like James Black was a great drummer. He's passed away. Alvin Batiste, great uh, clarinetist also, he has passed away. Nat Paralat, he's a great saxophone player, he also has passed away. So I was always around them, and I knew they would, I, I didn't put it in terms of being extreme because that was just life, but I knew they believed in the music. So even though I didn't like what they played, I respected them. And I think they also had a way of t talking to kids like they would never talk down to you. Or, and what do you think? They kind of sing song way adults sometimes deal with kids. They, they talk to you very directly. And I always wanted to be like them with the, with the level of reality and intelligence and involvement in, uh, in social and political things that they had and a belief. 
So, so I, I had many, many mentors. Now how, uh, you came to New York at a relatively early age. And, right. uh, I think you were about 18, and yeah. uh, you went to Juilliard. Now, what mm -hmm. led you to do that? I mean, that's not a classical path for right. a, a jazz right. trumpeter, is it? Well, I was 17 when, when, I, when, 17. I, when I came out, 17. And uh, I, my father always encouraged us to learn all kinds of music. When I was 13, a guy gave me a recording of the great French classical trumpet player, Maurice André. He said, "Listen to this record." And he just said, I, "I didn't even know him." A guy came on the on the streetcar who was also a trumpet player. He noticed I had a trumpet case. I went home. I put the record on, and I said, "I wonder if I could learn how to play like like this: Haydn trumpet concerto and, and classical music." So the next year, I won a concerto competition with the New Orleans Philharmonic. So I was 14. I had the chance to play the Haydn trumpet concerto with the with the Philharmonic. And, and I got into classical music. I studied it in high school. I went to arts high school, loved Beethoven's music. And I learned how to play the different trumpets, piccolo trumpet. And in New Orleans, uh, there weren't a lot of people playing those kind of instruments. So uh, I would be called for every Messiah people played, every time they played the Magnificat, every time there was any Handel, Royal Fireworks music, anything that required a piccolo trumpet. Here I would come with my afro, and I was in my you 1970s wore an Afro get up, man. Look, I was I was in the 1970s revolution. I had my thing. I played in the funk band most of the time, playing like Parliament, Earth, Wind, and Fire tunes. But I also had the opportunity to play the Magnificat, or you know, these pieces that required a real high Baroque trumpet. And uh, I took an audition for Juilliard. I got in. I had my trumpet. I had a really great trumpet teacher that studied with the trumpet teacher at Juilliard. William Vacchiano was the trumpet teacher. Juilliard taught many musicians taught Miles Davis amongst other trumpet players down through the years. He, his, his student, George Jansen, was my teacher in New Orleans, and he taught me a lot about uh, classical music, orchestral music, uh, how to play, what to play. And uh, I was fortunate, I, I won the audition. Also being in New Orleans, I had the chance to play with the New Orleans Philharmonic. Whereas if I were in New York or Philadelphia, a, a larger city, a, a, a high school trumpet player would never get a call to play Mahler's Tenth Symphony or it's be Pines of Rome or something that requires extra trumpets. Whereas in New Orleans when I was 15, 16, 17, I always had the opportunity to play extra trumpet with the orchestra. It, it wasn't really that big a deal. I mean at that time it was just, uh, I, I was excited about doing it, but it's not like any of my friends <laughs> listen to orchestral <laughs> music or they knew what that was. But uh, what a range, and uh, you've made uh, since then 40 recordings or over 40 recordings. You've won nine Grammys, including classical recordings. It's just right. an amazing record of accomplishment. Uh, now, you've been uh, likened, Winton, to uh, the greatest uh, trumpeters uh, of all time, uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, Dizzy <laughs> Gillespie. Uh, what, uh, uh, Bix Beiderbeck, uh -huh. there's another guy yeah. whose uh, parents didn't like the idea he was <laughs> playing the horn. Uh, uh, and Al Hurt, of course, and uh, I mean, what do you think differentiates the, their playing from others, and what, what do you suppose differentiates you from them? I think we all have, uh, we all have different styles. Of Louis Armstrong, of course, is the, the teacher of all of us in many fields, as, as a musician, as a singer, uh, the range of material he could bring authenticity to from from spirituals to gospel to country songs to, to Argentinian tangos to jazz numbers American popular song he's unbelievable genius of American music and Dizzy's way of playing in the time and his sound I think just uh, the decisions we make on our instruments and uh, mainly our sounds are, are, are very different you can always tell the different musicians by the it's, it's really like, a lot like a voice now, uh, almost all, uh, all of these trumpeters were uh, African Americans. Uh, you said they came from the bowels of the of the caste system. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but do you feel you came from the bowels of the caste system? No, I don't. I don't. Not at all. By 1961, I mean, when I was born, it was not like Louis Armstrong's. The, w the caste system was still in place. I grew up largely in segregation. But it wasn't the same. My father had a college degree. My mother had also a college degree. Um, it was from black black institutions, but it was still a college degree. Whereas Louis Armstrong, man, I mean, it's, it's, it's speculated that his mother was a prostitute. He didn't really grow up with his father. He grew up in the worst neighborhood. He was sent to a boy's home when he was uh, 11, or tw I think 11 years old. And that's actually how he learned how to play the trumpet, because he, he shot a gun on 4th of July. and. Uh, 
they lived in a very different different type of world. Well, he went to uh, the White House and he told Eisenhower that in the South they were violating <laughs> the Constitution. Right. Just well, I mean, he face just, to face. Right. Just because this, that's the, another thing about America is, as always, Frederick Douglass met with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. So, our way of life is very fluid, and. Uh, so we always had the sense of the possibility, and of course, I was uh, uh, growing up during the civil rights movement, so I was always very conscious of the struggles that were taking place to ensure that there was a level of equality. Now, the, envir the environment I grew up in was very much the Old South, so it was not, in, in no way was it equal. So it was very much like the old segregated kind of way of looking, but there was in the air the feeling of hopefulness and the sense that people were working together to do it. And because my father was a jazz musician, I understood that it was not an issue of black versus white. It was black and white versus white. And that makes a big difference. And jazz musicians generally were always on the cutting edge of integration. And from an intellectual standpoint, they never endorsed really supremely nationalistic ways of thinking that were antithetical to the, the highest of the American principles and ideals and the highest levels of humanism. Somebody like Louis Armstrong was not representing separatism from people or superiority of the black man. Duke Ellington was not representing that. Charlie Parker was not representing that. Thelonious Monk. They were on too high a level of consciousness. And with my father being in that lineage, uh, I would always see him in the barber shop or somewhere during the periods of extreme nationalism, arguing that when it was not a popular view, arguing for integration in America, arguing for equality of all people not being what you, what you would consider to be anti-white, but not Uncle Tommen or acting like everything is cool in the country, but definitely not going in the other direction into the type of uh, kind of a absurd philosophical direction that many people were going in. So the message was we're all in this together. Right. Uh, yes. Now, uh, you made the statement, I think, in one of your lectures that uh, once you let freedom loose, there's no telling where it'll go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what, what do you right. mean by that? <laughs> I mean, I think it plays out most in your, in your family, in your family system. You educate your kids, you want to teach them what you can teach them, you want to give them opportunities <coughs> and experiences, and you want to give them the freedom to develop their own person. Well, one of the first things they're going to do is counterstate what you want. So now you let freedom go with them, you didn't keep them under thumb, now they're telling you you're wrong about something you really believe in. And what do you do? You squash them? Do you make them not have their independence and their freedom? Or do you then figure out how am I going to negotiate this terrain with this new thinking or with this new? And I think a lot of the movements we see in our, in our culture and our society has to deal with how do we balance what we think to be true, which we never know, we think something, and the fact that when, you, when other people are free to express themselves and come up with things and be creative, they will strongly counterstate your sense of the world. Well, that's your commitment to education and teaching. So uh, why don't you tell us what you're doing with education and the schools and young people, and particularly, if you can, with reference to the Internet and the social media. Well, it, we, have, uh, we, we have so many edu education programs that have been very successful. For, for the youngest kids, WeBop is for, for infants to small children to the Middle School Jazz Academy, which is middle school age, Jazz for Young People, which And when you say we, you mean Jazz, jazz at Lincoln Center? Jazz Lincoln Center. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, the, the Jazz for Young People, which is based loosely on Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts, using analogy to illuminate fundamentals of music. We have two national curriculums. One we put out, Jazz for Young People curriculum. Another we did with the, with the National Endowment for the Arts, teaching social studies through the prism of, of jazz, a very successful curriculum. We have... Uh, uh, 101 uh, education for, for, for adults and kids, people of all ages. So we are now in the process of, of bringing our education programs national. We have a, a, a Ed Webb program that we're, we're working on, getting our modules of, of out and, and making all of our content free and available to everybody to go online uh, and, and interface with the best of our Jazz for Young People content. You can learn about Dizzy Gillespie, when he was born, what is bebop, what makes it the way it is, Charlie Parker's birth, Louis Armstrong, what makes him a great jazz singer, what scat singing is, so on and so on and so forth. And over the next five years, we're going to just release uh, uh, lesson after lesson after lesson in small modules, five minutes, four minutes, six minutes. And uh, we're excited about that in addition to getting national curriculum for our Webop and for our Middle School Jazz Academy.
Well, you believe that uh, really uh, uh, teaching in, uh, in the arts and teaching about our cultural heritage is just missing in our schools today, right. do you not? I think it's, it's, missing in our, it's missing in our schools, it's missing in our, in our understanding of, it's, it's keeping us from understanding each other because our culture is what people worked out to negotiate the life that we were living on this land. There are many solutions in Louis Armstrong, in Duke Ellington, in the Fisk Jubilee Singers, in Benny Goodman's big band, in the music of George Gershwin, Cole Porter, in the, in the, in the writings of Walt Whitman, on and on and on. I could go through the history of American culture and arts, issues we grapple with today. There are solutions in their work. We don't know that these solutions are there. That's why we tend to look at each other as groups. A group of age, a generational segregation, racial segregation, the hyphenated America, kind of different people come from different places and they automatically want a stake in this land on the terms of their previous land, which is not the American proposition. It is a mulatto proposition. You come here and you're not here to, to establish another Italy or another France or another Certainly not another Greece. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't help yourself. <laughs> I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> you know, you're here to be a part of the experiment of the melting pot, but the culture teaches you how to be a part of it. And when you don't have that cultural understanding, it becomes a matter of power and numbers. And we're in that in that kind of a in, in that period of our development now. But you relate this idea, don't you, to, the, to our Constitution, that it brings us together and its values right. bring us together. Can right. you explain how art, have you related art to the Constitution? Well, the Constitution is a sturdy framework that lays out a balance of powers. It's very, most state constitutions are, have many more pages than our national Constitution. It's a light framework that's intelligently constructed that protects the concept of, of uh, protects the concept of freedom and it negotiates between states and the federal government. How the state, which represents individuals, deal with all of us together, the one and the many. And in jazz, it's like a balance that we're always doing. I can solo and I can do all these things myself, but I, how am I gonna account for the bass not being heard? Or how am I gonna account for the fact that there's three other people who need to solo? How am I going to? So the constant kind of balancing, and that's why our constitution can be amended. It's, there's not the sense with our constitution that it's written in stone and nothing can be done to change it. Very hard to change it, though. It's hard, but it can be done. Yeah. And uh, just like it's hard to change your mind about something you really believe to be true, you can change it. And uh, the, the thing that our Constitution does for us is it gives us the open-ended thought. Like a skyscraper just stops at the top in most instances. Boom. Uh, it could be 20 more stories, we, but we stop, we're stopping it here. So kind of like that. Uh, I think you've uh, lectured with Supreme Court Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor <laughs> right. on the relationship between jazz and the Constitution. Right, and, uh, I loved it. And the, the various elements of the jazz band and the various articles and the branches right. of government. Right. Well, that's, that's all very interesting. Now, uh, I thought perhaps since you brought your wonderful trumpet with you and your magnificent talent right. uh, that you might play something for it. Okay, this is, I'm gonna play a song that's, today is Buddy Bolden's birthday. Buddy Bolden, I, I spoke about him earlier, is the first jazz man. And this is a song that great trumpeter Bunk Johnson, who was second generation of Buddy Bolden, said. He whistled uh, as an older man and said, this is what a, a piece that Buddy Bolden used to play. It's called Buddy Bolden's Blues. So I was like. <laughs> Magnificent. Thank you. Now, those are blues, or the, is that jazz or blues? That's or jazz. That's jazz. It's called Buddy Bolden's Blues, but it's not a blues. And, and, <laughs> and, and it's jazz because of the precision of, of the, the beat. It's jazz. It's impro improvisation, and it's, it uses a different form, and it, it has a certain 
It's jazz. It's jazz. <laughs> That's all that jazz. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that was just terrific. And this is the first for us on Digital Age that we actually have someone uh, playing an instrument in the okay. course of the interview, and it was, uh, it was just terrific. So thank uh, you. I want to thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the Digital Age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.